interpreting the FOMC policy statement, and how might the ECB follow through with its own when it meets on Thursday? Well, in terms of uh, the FOMC itself, there is nothing uh, materially new in the uh, in the in the text. Uh, perhaps uh, indicating a, you know slightly more flexibility in terms of when the Fed is going to be a, a changing the pace of, of the quantitative easing. But I mean, largely, uh, you know, the situation in the U.S. is, is unchanged. Uh, we have a very gradual uh, but persistent improvement in the U.S. labor market, which means that you know the end of QE and the normalization of uh, U.S. monetary policy will take place in all you know likelihood over the course of late 2014, early 2015. So from yesterday, from the U.S nothing material new. Now in terms of uh, Europe, the situation is a little bit different. We are looking for a rate cut of 25 basis points uh, today from the ECB. Uh, this is because we do have a, you know, quite a, s a significant risk of a credit crunch, in particular in the peripheral countries in Europe which are still struggling quite a lot. China official PMI data has shown further weakening in the economy. What are the policy implications? Um, I think there's, you know, a, a number of factors, um, but I think in, in general, I mean, if you take a, a, a broader look at the range of economic data that's coming out of China, you still have pretty good retail sales. Domestic demand is actually not that bad. Um, they also had a ramping up of the total social uh, financing that has come through. So probably, you know, we're still just sort of a we're in a, in a sort of a choppy period in terms of the data with probably an acceleration coming in, in a few months time. This is why I say that the data in China, although definitely not great, is also far from being a, a, you know, a major problem. And hence, the policy response from the authorities is going to be very minimal, I think, at this stage. Do you expect China to boost its ties with the ASEAN countries as economic growth in the U.S. and Europe continues to slow? Well, of course, I mean, if, if Chinese growth were to drop below, say, 7%, uh, then, you know, the impact would be, would be very, very significant. On the other hand, what is happening in Asia, which is extremely exciting, is the, um, you know, the potential for actually, you know, a, a quite a significant pickup in Japanese growth. And that is, in fact, where uh, investors pretty much around the world are really focusing on. So for the first time in a long time, Japan is actually overshadowing a lot of the events um, in, in, his, in, the, in the region. ASEAN's smaller economies, as you noted in your report, have done well in equity market returns. Is there more to go for ASEAN markets, or should investors focus back on larger emerging markets such as China, or head instead to Japan where radical policy reforms are taking place? Yes, absolutely. This is a broader trend that has been happening for a, a, a longer period of time. Uh, Intra-Asian trade, intra-emerging market trade, whether we look at uh, Asia uh, trading with uh, South America, Africa, elsewhere, uh, this has been growing very substantially and this is, we believe, is going to be a major trend going forward for the longer term. Of course, at the end of the day, this, the, the absolute size of the United States and also Europe will mean that these will remain uh, very significant trading partners also for the longer term. But on the margin, if you ask where is growth going to come from, absolutely. It's going to be intra-emerging markets trade with Asia at the top of that list.